Good evening. Thanks for coming out tonight. I'm Chris Wiley with the library, and it's just a pleasure to welcome back Dr. Yogi Breffman. This program is funded through Minnesota's Arts and Cultural Heritage Program, so thanks to you for supporting the Legacy Amendment. I did pass out evaluation forms, so if you would take a couple of minutes to fill those out after the program, there's a basket in the back. That helps us report to the state about the programs that we have here. Let us know, too, what else we can do for you. A special thanks to the Brown County Historical Society for helping to promote this program, as well as to New All Community Access Television for filming. Dr. Yogi Ruckman was here just in November to talk about the 1848ers, a topic near and dear to his heart. He's the executive director of the Stolenberg Institute for German American 1848er Studies. In recognition of Women's History Month, Dr. Ruckman's program tonight will focus on the most powerful woman in the world today, German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Please welcome Dr. Yogi Ruckman. Thank you very much, Chris, and hello, Mary Brown from New Holstein, Wisconsin. Yes, my name is Joachim Rettmann, better known with the nickname Yogi. Uh, the girlfriend in the playground 55 years ago could not pronounce Joachim, which is a tongue-breaking first old traditional name for Americans as well. So we had six month Yogi and Boo Boo, the comic series on German TV, and she used the name Yogi as a nickname. And for now 10 years, we have a national German soccer team coach and his nickname is Yogi as well. Joachim is old fashioned, so uh, Joachims in Germany are often called Yogi. Having said that, this started my interest in America, having this Yogi bear from the Yellowstone part as my kind of big buddy. The teachers in the high school did not know about Yogi and Boo Boo. They thought this is my Christian German name. And my note reports in high school uh, with the name Yogi Rapman and not with my Christian name. So maybe kind of uh, illegal education. <laughs> Talking about um, America, why are we here? Gitta, my wife is from Hamburg and I'm from north of Hamburg. This state is called Schleswig-Holstein, the northernmost German state. The northern border is Denmark and we are located at Flensburg, one mile south of Denmark. And you have a Flensburg in Morrison County um, near St. Cloud, a little bit west. So 1978, in college days, I drove with my buddy from Flensburg, Minnesota, stopping for some hours in New Alm, down to western Iowa. There's a little town called Schleswig, founded 1899. So Coming from the home state of Schleswig-Holstein in America, it was easy to have no homesickness going from Flensburg, Minnesota to Schleswig, Iowa. Today we talk about Angela Merkel, nicknamed Angie, or the German version of Mommy, Mutti, um, is a, another nickname, but we will go into the nickname business later. Why is it so fascinating? She was born in Hamburg, where my wife is from, and in Thanksgiving 1995, we got married in Las Vegas, secretly, and then I found my mother-in-law near Hamburg, and so on. So, Angie Merkel was born in Hamburg, 1954. Nine months after her birth, her father, who just finished studying Lutheran theology, took Angie and his wife going east, crossing the Iron Curtain into East Germany. In that year, 200,000 East Germans secretly got out of East Germany, communist East Germany, leaving that prison, that nightmare. But this happy theologian, Lutheran, decided, well, we have to support the Lutherans 
who are suffering under the communistic government in East Germany. So he went east to Mecklenburg, now, after unification, one of our 16 states. So that first step in her very early life was not her decision, it was her father's decision. Even the mother, who were, she was teaching Latin and English in Hamburg as a very young teacher, she didn't want to go to communistic East Germany, but followed the husband and followed her daughter with her husband. So that is such unusual move that we don't know anybody else in West Germany in those days who went from West Germany to East Germany. That was the beginning of her career in East Germany and being the daughter of a Lutheran pastor in East Germany meant many restrictions. The government tried to fight the church at the end, 1989. It was kind of de-Christianized, the whole society, more or less. She could not study what she had in mind, literature, history, uh, theology. All that was not possible in East Germany as a daughter of a Lutheran pastor. So what could she study after finishing high school in East Germany was physics. She became a PhD physicist in quantum chemistry, whatever that means. We have an expert here from the Mayo Clinic in a real intellectual, so later we have a title what she has published. I don't understand one word of that publication, but maybe who is originally from Silesia, and all of us will meet him later. We will celebrate at the Turner Hall into my birthday, so all of you are invited for a nice German birthday party. And Heinz and Jack from Northfield um, are sort of our guests from um, outside of New York. Danny Varta, as a dear friend, drinking buddy for many, many years, <laughs> Uh, gave a city tour of um, New Alm and Heinz is so mesmerized that he will sell his Frank Lloyd Wright house in Rochester and will move into your house with you, Denny. <laughs> then we have George Glotzbach, another dear friend. So uh, since 1978, Nor uh, New Alm is very close to our heart. The Quiet German in December 2014, not that long ago, the New Yorker wrote a long article about her, which is uh, very good. The guy, George Packer, did a lot of research in Berlin. He did not get an interview with uh, Angie, but um, many other persons around her in Germany, experts. So that is... Um, an interesting title. She was visibly insecure until lately giving speeches. She is very good in listening. She is very, very bright. And The Quiet German is a great title. 2007, we have a group of charming ladies who were powerful politicians. She became Lady Chancellor of Germany in 2005 for the first time, was re-elected again and again, and in Germany we don't have a term limit. So my prediction is in 25 years we still have Angie as uh, the Lady Chancellor of Germany because she is so successful in late German history, the most successful politician, Angie Merkel. This is her office in Berlin, and in behind, dear Heinz, having a good time with Danny at the Shell Brewery. <laughs> Whom do you see? <laughs> Very good. Well, Heinz um, grew up in uh, Silesia, now southwestern uh, Poland. He went to Hamburg, 1953, to medical school. Konrad Adenauer, the first post-war West German Chancellor, 
1949. He was a mayor of Cologne. He opened the Ford Company like 1922-24 uh, in Cologne. Then he was under house arrest uh, during the Hitler period from 1933 through 1945. And then he founded the Christian Democratic Union, which is our conservative party in Germany, the biggest party we have. I'm a paying member of that conservative party. And uh, the CDU and Angela Merkel would be mainstream Hillary Clinton. So what does it tell us? Our system is so much more to the left than your party system. Angie Merkel is sleeping five hours a night, loves to work, um, and is more successful than the boys. What do we have to see? It is unusual on three levels. Angie Merkel as a woman, divorced, no children, scientist, and coming from East Germany, becoming the Chancellor of the United Germany since 2005. There were several governors, boys in her party, who felt that they should be the Chancellor. And all these guys, like Roland Koch, Hescher, very successful governor, several of these men, they were positively sure that Angie, as a woman in a conservative party, without the traditional network, never will make it to be A, the chairperson of the conservative party in Germany, and B, becoming the chancellor. So this photo from 2008, all these boys who were sure that they would be the chancellor, and after she had been three years a chancellor, they still thought, well, uh, this is a little accident in politics. Soon I will be the chancellor. All these men are kind of now unknown and she is running the show better than ever. What I would like to stress is this situation. And I will give you in details a little background why we think it is like a miracle that somebody like her from East Germany could become chancellor. This is East Germany, a product of the Second World War. 1945, after Roosevelt, Churchill, Stalin had met in Casablanca at the Crimean uh, Peninsula, they had decided that this area of Germany, formerly East Germany, around Berlin, is occupied by the Red Army, by the Soviet Union. Southern Germany was occupied by the American GIs and a little bit by France, and Northern Germany was occupied by the English, by the British Army. One interesting situation, and there are many misconceptions, is West Berlin. West Berlin, part of Berlin, was occupied by France, Great Britain and France, Great Britain, and then the United, States. United States, sorry. Thank you, Geoff. And in 1961, when the wall was erected, a wall around West Berlin was erected. So West Berlin had been a capitalistic, free island surrounded by communistic East Germany. Often I have heard during the years, people thought in America and all over the world, West Berlin was somewhere here at the Iron Curtain. So part of Berlin was West Germany and the other part of Berlin, East Berlin, was East. No, West Berlin was with 1.8 million inhabitants, an island, especially from 1961, through the opening of the Berlin Wall, 1989. Here, and we will get more information, was the Iron Curtain from the Baltic Sea, which went down to the Mediterranean Sea, to Yugoslavia. And it was next to impossible to cross the Iron Curtain, either from East Berlin into West Berlin, 
or from West Germany into East Germany. The security and so on, we will go into more details. Now we have Germany, we have Bavaria with Munich, Oktoberfest. We have Northern Germany, our home state, Schleswig-Holstein. Hamburg as a city-state, the mayor is also governor, two million inhabitants, and Schleswig-Holstein with our hometown Flensburg near Denmark, 80,000 inhabitants. West Germany, round about the size of Minnesota. East Germany, round about the size of a large county in Texas. 15 million inhabitants. In those days, 62, 63 million inhabitants. Now altogether, a little bit over 80 million inhabitants. Nowadays, Germany, the United Germany, has the size of Montana. Can you imagine to push 80 million Californians into Montana? That would be Germany. Or East Germany, metropolitan area of New York City. If you have a gigantic wall, like the wall between Israel and all their neighbors, around New York City metropolitan, then you have around about 15 million people. And that was the situation. East Germany was a prison. There was no way to get out of East Germany to West Germany. And the vast majority of East Germans could not visit the Soviet Union, Russia, or even Poland. The exception was Angie Merkel. She was in high school so bright and in two subjects, Russian and math, she was winning the East German high school Olympic games. So Angie Merkel made it because of her super talent speaking Russian and so on as a visitor to the Soviet Union. And nowadays Putin says, well, I can talk with the Lady Chancellor of Germany in Russian or in German, because Putin is speaking fluent um, German. Putin, when the wall came down 1989-1990 in Dresden, south of Berlin, he was working seven years for the KGB. So while he was in Dresden, he learned excellent German and gave in 2002 in the German parliament, now in Berlin, a wonderful high quality German speech and uh, we will talk about Putin and all the challenges lately a little bit later as well. The Iron Curtain. Munich, Bavaria, Northern Germany, our home state of Schleswig-Holstein. This was the Iron Curtain. Here we have West Germany, the Federal Republic of Germany, then DDR, the English version GDR, German Democratic Republic. Here was a kind of little, uh, nothing special, just um, marking that West German um, visitors or tourists or so should be aware that they are now crossing into East Germany. But then a nightmare of security, fences, self-shooting installations, dogs, and for this little border, 500,000 East German soldiers protected from the East German side um, any attempt of East Germans fleeing into West Germany. Then the watchtowers and this kind of fence went on three miles into East Germany. So when you were an East German and wanted to visit a friend in this range of three miles to the Iron Curtain, you needed a lot of paperwork, you needed a lot of screening by the secret police in East Germany, even to visit somebody uh, whom you know, a relative or anybody. So for three miles, 
there were installations, border um, control dogs, mines, a lot of mines, and day and night the East German soldiers, half a million, had the order to shoot their own people if they were even coming close to the fences. 1987, we have the Brandenburg Gate, which was part of the Iron Curtain, but it was on East Berlin, East German territory, and your president, Ronnie Reagan, came to Germany, visiting the Chancellor Helmut Kohl, and he gave, on the West Berlin side, next to the Brandenburg Gate, a speech, and he said these famous words, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. In 1987, I thought, what a dingbat. <laughs> In the next 200, 300 years, there will be this wall. Nobody, German secret police, anybody I know, there was not one person in West Germany or in America, at least I don't believe when somebody tells me now, he would have known. Who would have known until even November of 1989 that the wall will come down. It was beyond imagination for us in West Germany um, that this wall, as described, will be gone for the next 100, 200, 300 years. So when he spoke these words, we felt, oh God, typical Hollywood guy, former actor, he had too many illegal drugs or whatever, <laughs> what a happy dreamer. Um, we just thought, impossible. And I have a friend in Ames, Iowa, in 1986, he took me to his local Rotary Club and I was asked about the Berlin Wall and I said, well, I have a bet, the crown jewelry of the British Queen, this wall in my lifetime never will come down. Bob Vos, my buddy in Ames, always makes jokes now about me, um, about the crown jewelry of the British Queen. So. Roddy Reagan, I'm a historian, the Pope, one of his buddies, and Maggie Thatcher, who hated actually Germany, uh, West Germany and Germany, that's an interesting uh, aspect, I will touch later again. Those three, they had that vision, let's crack down communism. And even my friends in Northfield from the Democratic Party, when I speak highly of Ronnie Reagan, in terms of without him, we still would have the wall. They don't like to hear that, some of them at least. So this speech in 1987 was amazing. Who knows that man? Bob Zolek, we would say Zolek. He was chief of staff of uh, President George Bush Sr. And George Bush said to him, Bob, you have a low German-speaking grandmother in Illinois. You manage now German unification. In Europe, in Europe, all our neighbors, France, a very, very close and dear neighbor, and everybody was against German unification. They said, well, they started the First World, they started the Second World, Prussian militarism, blah, blah, blah. It's a nightmare. We don't want Germany united. There is no way. And Ronnie Reagan had started it. George Bush Sr. said, no, liberty, let's have a united Germany. Even though Maggie Thatcher, Mitterrand, visited him, phoned him. Now all the records from Great Britain after 20 years are available. It is amazing to see how much pressure was put on poor little Georgie Boy Bush senior president not to allow German unification. And the guy who had to work on the details was Bob Zollick. Bob Zollick, a career diplomat and many jobs, was one year chief of staff in the White House 
during that period. And we had the pleasure, Gitta and I, to have a dinner with him in the German embassy in uh, middle of December 2012. He was voted to be the German American of the year and the German embassy in Washington did a very smart move years ago. They hired a French chef. So in Washington, everybody knows, well, with the Germans, there's the best food. So people are not coming because of interest in Germany, but there is always good food. And we had a state dinner and he gave a speech as a little thank you, not a long speech, after he had received the award and said, well, um, my boss in the White House, President Bush knew, and now you will know too, my grandmother in Illinois spoke low German with me. This is the dialect on the countryside in Northern Germany. And uh, before I go on, um, Mary and Chris, we have some gifts. It's better to have an uncle who has gifts than an aunt who plays piano. This is Letters of a German-American Farmer. Jörn Jakob Swains traveled to America. And this is my book in three languages, Low German, High German, English. What is the interesting thing? 1916, in a little village in Mecklenburg, near where Angie grew up, there was a teacher, Johannes Gilhoff, who wrote a little novel. That novel was published during the First World War in a Berlin newspaper, and everybody loved it. And then it was published as a book, and now one million copies had been sold. Ten years ago, a pastor, August Trost in Des Moines, has translated it, and we have a wonderful presentation. Please invite us in November, and everybody's coming for that topic. <laughs> so, talking about Bob Zollick, low German. He said, well, my grandmother is from the Mecklenburg, Angie Merkel area. And when I spent my summer holidays with Grammy, she spoke low German with me. I don't recall too much anymore, but she was the best grandmother on the world. And because of that background, George Bush felt I should organize the unification which took place 1990. We thought, wow, that guy is really dear to our heart. So we mailed him the book which we had written about low German in America and low German, high German and English. And he wrote an email back. And at that time, 2012, he was president of the World Bank and said he had a misconception. As a little boy, he thought low German is low quality German. As a countryside dialect, and in the book, well, we talk about it, Low German is the lowlands in northern Germany. And if Luther would not have translated the Bible into High German, all Germans would talk Low German, because that was the main language. And the, low Ger the High German was just by intellectuals and by monks, and that's why Luther chose High German instead of Low German. Um, in 1992, two years after the unification, bought a ticket for his wife and himself, flew into Hamburg, uh, into Berlin, rented a car, and he was already president of the World Bank, but he did not inform the American embassy. He traveled incognito. He wanted to see what has happened now with his unification. And he came to Rostock, to northern uh, part of East Germany, formerly East Germany. Rostock is the harbor town um, to the Baltic Sea. And he went into the city hall of Rostock. 250,000 inhabitants, similar to St. Paul. And in the city hall, he saw Zollig. Same spelling, but good old Bob, as a polite American, a shy, whatever, he did not dare to talk to the Bürgermeister. Bürgermeister in Germany, we have the Oberbürgermeister who is elected, like here, and then we have the Bürgermeister who is civil servant, kind of the city manager who is doing the work. <laughs> All that was part of the speech in December 2012. So Gitter and I, after we had mailed him the low German book, uh, which we had written, we traveled to Rostock and found easily 
the former Bürgermeister Zöllig, and long and behold, these were relatives. So we wrote Bob Zöllig and said, well, we have your relatives, cousins, third grade, or quite, but relatives. And he said, well, he would like to wait some years when there is not so much attention. And then we wrote Angie Merkel and said, well, uh, dear Angie, we have Bob Zöllig, and as you know, he organized the German unification. Don't you think it would be nice to make him an honorary citizen of your Mecklenburg home state, where you are still a member, uh, always voted this Mecklenburg into the parliament? And she said, uh, one of her um, department bosses uh, immediately wrote back and said, yes, um, Angie thinks this is a great idea. So we are working, getting Bob Zöllig over to Mecklenburg, the capital is Schwerin now, not the biggest city, Rostock, to get him the honorary citizenship of Mecklenburg. This is Angie as a little girl. Four years old, five years old. This is me in East Germany behind the Iron Curtain as a four-year-old one. My grandmother, Bob Zolek thinks he had the best grandmother of the world. I know I had the one. <laughs> and the much, much younger sister of my mother. So what happened? Did I go over to the communists like Angie had done? No, this did not happen. Flensburg, border town to Denmark, once a year, summer vacation, 4.27 in the morning, the first train from Flensburg to Hamburg. Then we had to change trains and went to Büchen, which was the border crossing from West Germany to East Germany. Once a year during the summer holidays, my parents and I were visiting Grammy in East Germany in Jena. Known one of the German Shakespeare's Schiller was a professor of history in Jena. What had happened? Similar situation like Heinz Warner. These Prussian provinces, these German provinces east of nowadays Germany, nowadays Poland, Pomerania, Heinz Warner country, Silesia, were given by Stalin to Poland. And Stalin, Soviet Union, took the eastern provinces of Poland. So the border, 1945, was just moved west. That meant 15 million Germans from these eastern German provinces of Prussia moved west. So Schleswig-Holstein in 1945 uh, in May had one million inhabitant. One month later, two months later, two million inhabitants. My mother, after she had finished high school in Pomerania, 1944, she came via Berlin to Flensburg, ran into my dad, and that's why I'm talking to you. Heinz Warner, in August 1945, correct Heinz? Uh, his village was told, you guys have two hours time, one suitcase per person, get out here. And Heinz was 15 years old, moved with his family, with his village, three, 400 people, from Silesia to Berlin. Back to my family situation, my mother came on April 22nd. Berlin was already surrounded by the Red Army, but there was one street still out. She came from Berlin to Schwerin to Flensburg and arrived May 2nd in Flensburg, six days before the Second World War was over. Her parents came from Pomerania, like Heinz, to what is now the state of Thuringia, south of Berlin. So, 1961, three weeks, a few weeks before the Berlin final wall was erected, before, before the final Iron Curtain was uh, coming into place, we entered the train at 427, and it took 12 hours, nowadays five hours, to go by train over to Grammy, down to this area. At the border, the train, it was now already 11 a.m. 
summertime, very hot, stopped two hours at the Iron Curtain. The East German border control immigration officers came in, in the left hand, they had a machine gun, and in the right hand they had a stamp and controlled your passport. My brother and I thought this was really exciting. This was like a life movie. We, as little kids or so, were not afraid. My dad, civil servant, German healthcare system, already when we left Hamburg, he was sweating. He could not stand physically, mentally, this situation that the East German border guards, and later we learned that they were paid to give the West Germans a hard time. East Germany wanted to be separated from West Germany in terms of soccer, in terms of sports, everything was different in East Germany. So for us, it was a wonderful experience. Grammy, as the best grandmother in the world, we arrived or most of the time at 10, 30, 11 p.m. And even though we were little boys, Grammy had a glass of champagne. Everybody had to drink that stuff and Second, Grammy had a leather wallet for my brother one and one for me with cash money. And Grammy did not say you buy books and all that stuff. We could do what we, she treated us like human beings, like real men. <laughs> In contrast to the rich West pa German parents, they didn't even give us pocket money. My mother saved the money so the kids can go to college and stuff like that. Well, so Grammy was the best because it was wonderful visiting her on all levels. So every summer, Angie Merkel is just a few years older than I am. I grew up for three, four weeks in East Germany, had my East German buddies, and later in high school and so on, became an expert of what the lifestyle, the situation had been. West Germans who had relatives in East Germany and had a car. You could not take your car and visit East Germany. You had to take the train. Second, the East German government said, well, there is a family of four persons, every day 25 West German marks. They needed the strong West German currency, so you paid to the East German government for every day visiting your East German relatives. It was quite an experience on all levels. This is Angie Merkel. 1989, late December. She was a physicist. She studied in Leipzig. She got married the first time to a guy, Ulrich Merkel, 1977. Short marriage, 1982, she got divorced. And 1983, she finished her PhD, went to East Berlin to a scientific research center and never had any contact with politics. As a daughter of the pastor, many, many reasons, she volunteered in a new party democratic awakening in East Berlin. That was the time where Bob Zölig organized German unification, and there was in March 1990 a free election, the only free election of um, East Germany. And communication. Hardly anybody in East Germany was owning a phone. A, it was not possible to get a phone. B, if you had a phone, it was uh, dubbed, it was controlled by the secret police in East Germany. So when these parties in 1990, early 1990, started campaigning in East Germany for during the first election, these were uh, gifts from West German foundations uh, for communication. She had supported an East Berlin lawyer um, who was in that um, party of democratic awakening. She became her spokesperson. Um, she went with him to Moscow to all these meetings before East and West Germany had been united on October 3rd 1990. Because of her brilliant mind um, at a press conference with her boss, she was suggested by her boss after unification to German Chancellor Helmut Kohl 
This is a bright lady. You better have her as a secretary for youth and women. So 1991, after Kohl had been elected for the 50th time as a chancellor, he was a long, long time a chancellor in West Germany and then United Germany, she became a very young East German lady on the highest level of German politics. 1998, Angie Merkel was already um, a politician and um, her career was developing. She married a professor of physics, uh, quantum chemistry, Joachim, my name, Sauer. They had met, this is an East German photo, after she got divorced, they became colleagues. And here they are at Bayreuth at the Wagner um, Festival. Jack loves, um, as a great union carpenter, Wagner. And Angie Merkel likes Wagner too. So that's what you have in common, Jack, with Angie. Again, um, during the time, which was very exciting, November 1989 through unification, October 3rd, 1990, it was a miracle that a peaceful revolution, that the Soviet Union was so packed without one drop of bloodshed, that a whole system, the communistic system in Eastern Europe, gave up kind of, and Angie was already very active. That is one of the first meetings that Helmut Kohl, the big, large West German Chancellor, then the Chancellor of Unified Germany, had met Angie. And in order to make a career in the Conservative Party in Germany, you must be very close to the governor of Bavaria. Bavaria is like Texas. Bavaria doesn't want to be part of Germany. And when you don't drink beer with the governor of Bavaria, there is no way to be chancellor. This governor was so powerful in 2002, she wanted to be in the Conservative Party already the candidate for uh, chancellor, but this guy Stoiber, now nearly forgotten, had the power as a governor of Bavaria that she withdrew and when he failed, as we all had expected because these Bavarian guys have no chance in northern Germany, uh, so even the beer drinking didn't help him. Angie was becoming chancellor in 2005. Her predecessor in between Helmut Kohl and her was a guy uh, from our Liberal Party, Gerhard Schröder, and Gerhard didn't get along with George Bush. Unheard since the Second World War, all West German chancellors came along very well with your presidents. But uh, Gerhard Schröder did not believe in the Iraq war, and George didn't like the, West Ger uh, the German chancellor. Well, when Angie became chancellor, George visited her in Mecklenburg, in her village where she grew up, and they had a big party, uh, Texas style, uh, Mecklenburg style, so everything was fine. Then Angie came to the Congress. And you guys in Minnesota might know this gentleman. Um, Germany is nothing without Europe. And for us, European integration is everything. So 1945, end of the Second World War, the first German Chancellor, Konrad Adenauer, realized as a former mayor of Cologne near France, we must have a friendship with France. All the wars, 1817, 1871, Prussia against France, and then the German Empire was founded, was always against the arch enemy France. As a little boy, as a little baby, through 1945, Heinz can recall that, you learned in Germany before you said Mama, you knew you must hate France. That was over in 1945. Konrad Adenauer and Charles de Gaulle developed as two boys a close friendship, West Germany and France. My wife Gitta, part of that uh, youth foundation, she went every summer when I went to East Germany 
to the communists and visiting great Grammy. She went to France and spent with French high school kids summertime. Everything was highly funded by a German-French foundation. So nowadays, Henry Kissinger says, well, Germany is too large for Europe, but too small for the world. So Angie needs Europe because with Europe, Angie is the powerful person as she is. With Angie, who is not talking, quiet German, the New Yorker, um, all these boys around her, Sarkozy, proud French prime minister, with a body language, you always can tell when she is visiting somewhere, somebody in Europe or the world, everybody is trying to please her, don't scold me, uh, please be nice, Angie, to me, don't tell anybody that I'm an idiot, uh, just um, keep us uh, happy and I will do anything and everything. The big CEOs in Germany from Siemens or BMW, Mercedes, who are fairly independent, they did not listen too much what the German chancellors, the boys, had to say, but in the case of Angie, they follow her blindly, which is just amazing and fantastic. This is after this terrorist attack um, of the cartoon news uh, magazine in um, Paris. Um, uh, Angie went to Paris um, to help her uh, colleague Hollande. 2008, the crash of the New York stock market, uh, German banks, uh, huge banks went bankrupt as well. And this was the Secretary of um, Finances, bright guy. And this was the Secretary of uh, Economic Development. And Germans need and want security. We have a huge middle class, strong um, social solidarity, and the largest part of our society is very well off and even better off after Angie is chancellor. So there was some fear of what will happen to our bank accounts, our savings. My grandmother in 1923 experienced an inflation after the First World War. You paid for one potato in Germany, three trillion German marks, 1923. 1947, 48, after the Second World War, another currency reform, all the money um, around was not valid. Heinz can recall that from his days. Every German started with 40 German marks. So it is a collective neurosis or fear in the German society when money savings are on stake. 2008, they went in front of the medias and said, well, don't worry, uh, your savings, dear Germans, 80 millions or so, we make sure that nothing will happen. Well, they could not, they just had to pacify. But these guys, again, were not very convincing, but we believed her. Again, a very difficult situation and she knew how to run the show. Well, these world summits, um, very little, a few uh, ladies are around, and when you look to the faces, none of these world politicians are still in power in their uh, respective offices. But Angie also enjoys uh, visiting kindergarten, and she fixed the broken German education system lately. She is the chairperson of the CDU, Christian Democratic Union. In order to be chancellor in Germany, you must be first, you must have in one of the big parties a power base, and then you run to be chancellor as a candidate of your party. So that is quite a different situation. She loves the Baltic Sea, Mecklenburg. We love the Baltic Sea because Flensburg is located at the Baltic Sea, and these are beach baskets. Uh, our summers are not as hot as your summers. We have no humidity and unfortunately no mosquitoes. So when there is a little breeze from the Baltic Sea, you sit in the uh, beach basket and enjoy the summer. This is iconic, famous. She loves to have her hands like a rhombus. Rhombus? Does that make sense? Shape of a... 
Yes, thank you. George, you always help me. You know, in November 20th, when, when I didn't uh, know um, Anstandswa, wow, you translated that as well. Thank you, uh, George. Well, this is sort of her uh, trademark. Whenever she is somewhere uh, waiting, listening, she has this position. Now, Angie, and nowadays, um, Germany and the near future, and we will invite you all. Let me have a little look. George, don't tell me how late it is. Thank you, George. Um, Berlin, Lübeck, state of Schleswig-Holstein, northeast. Lübeck used to be one mile west of the Iron Curtain, a beautiful town together with Bamberg, one of the two most beautiful cities in Germany, queen of the Hanse Eddig League. And Angie will open on May 27th, uh, on 28th or 27th, one of the two days, a new museum in downtown uh, Lübeck, a rich foundation, gave 60 million euros and they have built a museum commemorating the, um, the Hanseatic League, the European First Europe Union, Low German was the business language, uh, from Bergen, uh, Norway, to Novgorod, Russia, all the cities uh, for 350 years did very successful business exchange and that is the topic of the new museum. Angie is coming to Lübeck. These are the countries, the main countries where the cities, not the countries, did constitute the Hanse Attic League and here in Lübeck will be the museum and Angie is coming to Lübeck for that museum. So if you happen to be in uh, Germany, in Europe, get an eye. We have an invitation to the opening of that museum. We would love to take you with us. This is the White House in uh, Berlin, the German Chancellery. Uh, during the time of Helmut Kohl, an architect developed uh, this office for her. And interestingly enough, in that office is a second uh, politician, the federal Secretary of Cultural Affairs. Like in America, the German states are independent from Berlin doing education and culture policy. But on an umbrella level, we have a guy who is giving money and support for cultural activities in Berlin. And this chief of staff, of which, who is now a lady, Monika, Alexandra Weber in the German Chancellery. She has her office next to Angie Merkel. And when we have visitors, this is a physician from Cedar Rapids, Klaus Peter Köln, uh, a North German who ended up in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And he gave a lot of money for our last conference at Wartburg College. So I asked Alexandra, can you do a special tour for uh, Klaus and his kids? And she took us around the Chancellery and um, everything is, even with the security issues, very relaxed. St. Olaf student, Mark Snyder, he did an uh, internship in the German parliament. And then the chancellor three years ago was visiting her party group in the German parliament. And Mark, as an intern, went over to her and said, well, can I have a photo? Oh, she said, sure, why not? Can you imagine that a German intern in the Congress is working and the American president is coming, visiting from the White House, the Congress, and the German intern would say, oh, President Obama, can we have a photo? So even with all the security, she is very easygoing, very relaxed. This is uh, Klaus Schüler, historian. He is the David Axelrod. He is organizing the campaigns for um, um, Angie Merkel to be re-elected every five years again and again. And now we have George and the test. Danny has left because he was afraid of being tested. We will compare a little bit how different the life of Angie Merkel and myself had been. 1978, Angie Merkel just had married, 1977. And why did you marry in East Germany? Why did you have to marry? Without being married, you didn't get an apartment. You had to stay 25, 26 years old with your parents. But when you were married, there was the chance 
to get a little one room, two apartment, much, much higher. So 1978, college days, I came to Chicago, Schleswig-Holstein Singing Choir. Angie was just married one year, and one reason why she married, like all East Germans, was getting an apartment. Well, I ran into this uh, topic of 1848, uh, democratic revolutionaries, 1848, all over Europe, a democratic revolution which failed. The North Germans from Schleswig-Holstein uh, went to Devonport, Iowa. In February, five days before Angie Merkel had visited 2015, uh, in February, your president, uh, Barack Obama in Washington, The Economist had a wonderful article, Willkommen Frau Merkel. And part of that article um, was this map, and I thought you will enjoy that. Um, a German newspaper in Devonport after the uh, revolution, high quality journalism. Germany in 1848 did not exist as we know it now. These were 36 independent kingdoms, Bavaria principalities, and Prussia under Bismarck. Otto von Bismarck was strong enough in 19, uh, 1817, 1871 against through a war against France to unite all these independent Germanic principalities. 1848, the first democratic German parliament had met in Frankfurt in this church where Kennedy later gave a speech. The leading most famous uh, emigrant from that movement, a student in 1848 was Karl Schurz. Under President Hayes, he became a secretary of interior affairs. The North German hero of that revolution, Theodor Olshausen, son of a Lutheran pastor, like Angie, came to St. Louis and was um, running a newspaper. In my university town, Kiel, capital of Schleswig-Holstein, we have the Olshausen Straße, the Olshausen brothers. He went to St. Louis and 2009 we opened a little monument and uh, Bruno Olshausen, um, brains, uh, neuro, scientist from Berkeley University, happened to be in Berlin, read about it and was visiting us on July 4th to see uh, his, the half-brother of these two boys where the half-brother was his great-great-grandfather. The German Olshausen went to St. Louis and ran this newspaper. Joseph Pulitzer, born 1847 in Hungary, German speaking, his first job as a journalist was at the German newspaper in St. Louis. Doing this research, visiting America, the Midwest, um, we had the chance to run into Henry Kissinger. And I will show you later a little bit why. 1999, my Carlton College student, born and raised in New York, accompanied me um, in middle of December, the day where the New York Times, as a cover story, wrote about the slash scandal um, of former West German, German Chancellor Helmut Kohl. And we gave him some marzipan from Lübeck, and that was a childhood memory. Why could we visit Kissinger? Our governor in Schleswig-Holstein, a historian who was very, very close to be chancellor of West Germany instead of Helmut Kohl, he became a friend in 1953 as a very, very young politician visiting America. And so that's why that uh, governor gave money for our early trips. Now we are also working on a second book about a professor and his wife from Carlton College, Northfield, Minnesota. 1948, they just had been married, Dean and Ian Barber. They married in November. 1947 in Washington, Georgetown. Five months later, kind of as the honeymoon, they went to Germany. She went to Hamburg and he went to a town, Münster near Cologne, and they ran church organized work camps with Dutch and German uh, students to rebuild the universities. And when they learned in 2003, they get us from Hamburg, the, she was very moved, um, Dean Barber, and we asked her later that night, 
Did you write diaries? And they wrote diaries about their experience in Berlin and Münster. And Heinz Warner knows about the diaries. And Heinz, a few years later, had been in Berlin, in Hamburg. And Hamburg was pretty much rebuilt already in that short time frame from 1948 to 1953. Here is a picture from Ian where um, the uh, chapel of the university um, in 1948 was rebuilt. Another guy whom uh, many, many charming ladies all over the world know is Eric Braden, the actor Victor from Young and Restless, the happy soap. He was also in Titanic, uh, John Jacob Astor, and he's from our home state. And last summer he came to Schleswig-Holstein visiting his uh, village, Bredenbeck, because his village turned 750 years and we have an ongoing tennis um, fight and he was winning 6-0, 6-1 and the one point was just because he felt sorry and when you know that somebody feels sorry that's even worse so uh, on uh, April 4th with my uh, friend a young student from St. Olaf we will be down in Beverly Hills because as a single I have no chance but in a double I'm sure we will win uh, in August uh, 2014, he came to Flensburg tennis and then he saw uh, the posters of Emil Nolde, an expressionist who uh, was working a little bit west of Flensburg and that's where his cousin and the deputy director of that um, gallery um, of Emil Nolde is. And now we are working on a little booklet and Schleswig, coming from Schleswig-Holstein, traveling to Schleswig, Iowa, founded 1899, and that's the logo like the tie of George and myself. 1848, the flag of the revolution, the black knight of tyranny, the red blood of the battles to a golden future of an American-style republic is now the flag of West Germany and East Germany, and here Iowa and Schleswig and America is very obvious. Well, near Schleswig, Iowa, we have the town of Holstein and at the centennial they drove us around in a wonderful Cadillac convertible Eldorado. Here we are back in Minnesota. Morrison County, Flensburg, Polish immigrants had founded Flensburg, Minnesota. Nobody knows why these happy Poles used the North German Lutheran city name for their American settlement in Minnesota, in Davenport, uh, Eastern Iowa, most North Germans from 1848 and Hungarian revolutionaries showed up, Theodor Olshausen, and he lived in a house. Today you get a beautiful tattoo. 1848, 50 years later, 1898, huge commemoration all over Germany, all over Europe for the democratic revolution which failed. In Davenport, these were veterans of the war from Schleswig-Holstein against Denmark and that stone which they had in downtown Washington Park near the Mississippi, now next to the German-American uh, Heritage Center, commemorating the revolution 1848 in 1917, after America entered the First World War, first yellow color, and then uh, people pushed that stone four tons into the Mississippi. 2008, we had a new stone, 16 tons, same engraving and it is highly unlikely uh, the same guys are probably not alive anymore. We are kind of hopeful that um, that stone will survive at least some years more in downtown um, Devonport. And people think sometimes in the Mad West Yogi and Gitter, Gitter, sorry, donkey at the end, uh, Gitter and Yogi uh, are overdoing it with Moin Moin. What do you know to survive in Germany? in terms of language. If you know Moin Moin, which means howdy, which means hello, which means goodbye, and George, most important, cheers. Yeah. So you move into a pub in my hometown Flansburg and say Moin or Moin Moin. When you say Moin Moin, they are a little bit suspicious and say, well, is that a guy, a chatterbox coming in here? So, kind of unusual. North Germans, they sit at the bar and drink their beer quietly and if you talk like me, you're, you must be an idiot. 
you drink your second, third beer, and when you're a little bit tipsy or drunk like a sailor, you go out and say moin moin, and that's all what you need to survive. So even a weekly a newspaper in my hometown is called Moin Moin. So therefore, thank you very much for your attention. I hope, uh, Mary and Chris, that in November we can have the next wonderful talk about Low German or about the diaries or about Eric Braden, whatever you ladies choose to decide. Thank you very much for your attention.